Hello? Testing, 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 testing. All right. Hello, everybody. How's it going tonight? Ben here, just getting things kind of set up, making sure we're ready to go. So, uh, as you can see here, we are starting on the most evocative and exciting thing that any Dungeon Master could possibly do, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so, we are going to talk tonight about the Planeswalker class that I was working on for the Ravnica game. Uh, da, 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 da. That's not it. There it is. This guy right here. So, for this class, there are a few things that I kind of had to take into consideration. And just this week, after the Raven uh, Raven's Deal Roleplays Ravnica episode on Sunday... I was looking over the Planeswalker class and just kind of making sure that all the math added up, made sure it still was uh, as efficient and effective a class as any uh, anything else. Specifically, I'm comparing it to other spellcasting classes. 
which is kind of a big deal since its you know primary thing is casting spells. So the thing that I found, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit, is that with the mana that Planeswalkers get, and thus the spells they're able to cast, I think it might be a little bit subpar compared to other casters. So that's kind of what I'm comparing right now. Um, and that's what this Excel sheet is looking at, specifically. So in this particular case, I am looking at... Com I'm comparing the Wizard, the Sorcerer, the Planeswalker. I'm going to put in all the other spellcasting classes as well. I know Warlock falls behind pretty significantly as far as actual spell slots go, but I'm just going to put them all in there for the sake of comparison. For right now, though, I'm fo focusing on the Sorcerer and the Wizard, because these are the classes that have the most... Um, they're the ones that can potentially get the most spell slots, effectively. So you've got the spell slot progression table for any wizard, any um, sorcerer, etc. And you can find that here. I'm using the 5th um, edition wiki SRD documents, or pages. But you can see the standard spell slot progression table for dedicated casters. It's the same for druids, for bards, for clerics, for wizards, for sorcerers. So this progression table starts you out with two first level spells at first level, and then by the time you get to 20th level, you've got four, three, yada, 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 whatever this total is. It's 10, 16, 20, it's 22 spell slots. But certain classes have some additional variability to that. So for instance, the sorcerers, they get sorcerer points, and they can spend those points in exchange for spell slots at a cost of two um, points per first level spell slot they want to regain. So that's pretty cool. It gives them a lot of versatility. It makes their spell casting more potent so they don't run out of spells as quickly. Wizards have something called Arcane Recovery where after a short rest, they can basically um, regain spell slots equal to one half their wizard level once per day. So that's kind of what I factored into our little Excel sheet here. Uh, my math is a little bit off of the sorcerers. I haven't gone through and factored in the spell cast or the sorcerer points for all of them. So the, this stuff in the middle, specifically from sixth to I want to say thirteenth, is probably off a little. So don't take that as gospel um, at this point in time. But the general premise is the same. So you can see here that when you get right down to it, sorcerers and wizards, fun like functionally, if you if Sorcerers are just going ahead and regaining first level spell slots with their sorcerer points, and if wizards are just regaining first level spell slots with their um, arcane, um, what's it called? Arcane recovery. Although I guess technically they can't regain for all first level spell slots with their arcane recovery, can they? Anyways, we're getting off topic. So I have to go through and tweak the math a little, but I'm kind of comparing to make sure that at 20th level, the Planeswalker is approximately as potent as a Spellcaster as everything else. Um, so we'll get back to that. So, my Excel spreadsheet aside, let's talk about the Planeswalker itself. We did a little intro of this last week. Um, it's kind of like a... Like a preview or a promo for the campaign. So some of this is going to be a bit of a repeat. It starts with the basics, hit die. Because it's a semi-combat class, it's not just meant to be a spellcasting class. We went ahead and we gave it a d8 hit dice to kind of represent that they can, you know, take a little bit more damage. So on par with warlocks and bards and clerics, I believe, and druids, I think, as well. <coughs> So nothing terribly special there, pretty standard stuff. Proficiencies, they get light armor proficiency because, again, they are kind of expected to be in melee a little bit. They've got some basic weapon proficiencies for, like, you know, the standard spellcasting stuff. I think it's the same list as a wizard when you get right down to it. No special tool proficiencies. They get one saving throw, and that's for dexterity um, inherently. But then when they choose their mana affinity for the different colors of mana they get an additional saving throw at that point. You've also got their skills. They get to choose two from, I 
think this is a pretty standard list for spellcasting classes in the PHB, whether they be sorcerer, wizard, whatever. So, <clears throat> starting equipment, they get leather armor. You know, it's kind of the basic armor that goes with a light armor proficiency. Any combination of two weapons that they're proficient with, or a weapon and a shield that you're proficient with, you may look at that and think, well, hold on a second, shield isn't listed anywhere up here. And you're right. Shields are, in fact, going to be listed specifically based on your mana affinity. Those give you additional bonus proficiencies. So we're going to get to that in a minute. Everybody starts with a dagger. You get five spell foci or um, tokens or whatever you want to call them. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And then a special satchel or pouch containing vessels for mana of your chosen affinity. So we'll talk about the two kind of mechanical aspects that lend it or lend to those starting items. Well, one moment, please. Water break. And I'm back. So, the first thing we've got is mana affinity. At first level, players choose an affinity for one of the five colors of mana. Black, blue, green, red, white. Color selected determines which types of spells you can select, as well as several class features. When you select mana affinity at first level, it determines your bonus proficiencies and your spellcasting ability. You select a new mana affinity at 5th, 9th, 13th, and 17th. So basically, this is what color of cards are in your deck, if you want to put it in Magic the Gathering trading card game rules, or terms. So they can select new colors when gaining a mana affinity, but they don't gain any of the bonus proficiencies associated with the new color. Um, all spells you cast with the new color rely on the spellcasting modifier associated with the mana color selected. So if you start with black, you're going to use the spellcasting ability modifier for black spells, and then if you tur turn around and you pick up red spells or, or red mana affinity later, then for red spells you're going to use your red mana affinity spellcasting ability. And we'll just detail what those are here in a minute. So next we are going to look at the actual class features table. This is just the quick summary of what players get. So at level one, you've got the standard proficiency bonus stuff. You know, pretty standard. Class features is mana affinity, we just talked about that. They get bonus proficiencies, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Mana spell casting and planeswalking. So because they're planeswalkers, at first level they can travel to different planes, which is super freaking dangerous. If you're a first level planeswalker just kind of figuring, you know what, I'm going to go to Pandemonium or you know Concordia or wherever, all these different places where you've got really high level celestials and fiends and whatnot. Of course, we're playing in the Magic universe, so some of those realms may not exist. They may be called something else, but the same threat or risk kind of applies. So it's cool that first-level players get this, but obviously there are risks associated. So they get their daily mana. This is how many mana they start with. So when they wake up in the morning, they do something called harnessing their mana, and that's what they can use to cast spells throughout the day. Their maximum amount of mana is two, so they can only have two mana at any um, at any point in time um, at first level. They have their four cantrips and their one first level spell, and these are the going to tie into the spell foci that we talked about earlier. You notice they get four cantrips, one first level. That's what that's relating to. At second level, they get something called mana kick, and they get an additional point of mana every day. And we're going to scroll down just a little bit, and we're going to talk about some of the, the two first level, or the first two levels, and what they give to the players. So first off, they get their bonus proficiencies and their spellcasting ability based on their mana affinity. So if they go with black, they've got no extra armor proficiencies, and they can choose to either be proficient in sickle and shields, or the glaive. So they could be like kind of big, two-handed, like reaper, grim reaper type, scythe-wielding characters. Or they could go with something a little bit more basic. They could do a club and a shield, a sickle and a shield, whatever the case may be. But the shield gives them a little bit more armor class to kind of defend themselves in a fight. Then they get Thieves' Tools or Poisoner's Kits. In Magic the Gathering, the um, black cards often refer to things like rogues, assassins, poisoners, things like that. 
So it made sense to me that black casters would get to start with one of those two things. The saving throw here is Constitution. They deal with the dead a lot that requires a fairly hardy Constitution, so you don't get sick, catch the plague, die, all those terrible things. So Constitution here, and the spellcasting ability for black spells is Constitution as well. For blue casters, they get the shield proficiency to add on to their leather armor, and then they can either choose the Morning Star or the Flail. Tools, they get the Forgery Kit or the Disguise Kit. In Magic, again, blue cards are a lot, of, um, they deal a lot with tricking the opponents or disguising things or making copies of things. So, Saving Throw is Intelligence, and the Spellcasting Ability modifier er, is Intelligence as well, because, again, it's all about book learning and how smart you are and things like that. So blue kind of focuses in that realm. Green gets medium armor, so they can start with some slightly heavier armor, either um, hide armor or chain mail or whatever the case may be. Uh, weapons, they get one ranged or thrown weapon and one simple weapon. The tools they get are woodcarver's tools or navigator's tools. And again, that fits into them being, you know, very woodsy, thus woodcarvers or navigators because they're good trackers, they're good guides, things like that. They get wisdom as their saving throw and spellcasting ability. Red, they get no extra armor proficiency, but they can choose a one-handed or a two-handed martial melee weapon proficiency because, you know, in magic, the red cards are usually all about getting big swords and running in and hitting things and dealing lots of damage and things like that. They can either take smith's tools or Climber's Kit. So Climber's Kit to reflect like their affinity for the mountains, Smith's Tools to uh, reflect their affinity for fire and for, you know, crafting things. Saving Throw here is Strength, as is the Spellcasting Ability modifier. And then for White, they get Medium Armor and Shields. Uh, their weapons, they get Long Sword, Short Sword, or Spear. Their tools, they get the Healer's Kit or Herbalism Kit. Their Saving Throw is Charisma, and their Spellcasting Ability modifier is Charisma. So these guys are kind of the classic paladin type characters so they get slightly heavier armor they get shields they get some of the uh, traditional um sort of archetypal um, martial weapons and the long sword the short sword or they could choose the spear if they want to go for a more like militia bent so gives you the ability to kind of select a mana affinity that ties into your background in a way that makes sense um from, from a role-playing perspective Next, the mana spellcasting is going to let people... It just kind of explains how mana works effectively. So it says that um, when you cast a spell of first level or higher, you must spend mana of the appropriate color based on the spellcasting list of the spell. You may spend additional mana to cast a spell at a higher level, as if you were expending higher level spell slots for a wizard or sorcerer. <clears throat> you cannot cast a spell at higher, at higher level than ninth. So what that means is, starting at first level, you got you start with a first level spell. And in 5th edition, one of the things I really like, it kind of keeps all the spells effective and useful across the length of a campaign, is that you can choose to cast a first level spell using a ninth level spell slot. And for every spell slot level that you, above its normal uh, slot level, that you use increases the damage that it does or increases the duration of this spell or whatever the case may be. Each spell works a little differently. Um, and normally, at first level, and even at second level, wizards, sorcerers, etc., they can only cast a spell at first level because they don't have any second level spell slots yet. Planeswalkers, though, you start with two mana, three mana if you're second level, which lets you go ahead and start throwing out um, you know, potentially higher level spells at first and second level. Because let's say you choose Magic Missile. Classic, you know, fairly straightforward spell. When you cast it, it does cast three darts at up to three different targets, 1d4 plus one damage each. Pretty straightforward, right? If you choose to cast it at, uh, using a second level spell slot, though, it does four darts at 1d4 plus one damage each. So... Wizards and Sorcerers have to wait until at least 2nd level to do that, or sorry, at least 3rd level to do that, because that's when they get their first 2nd level spell slot. But Planeswalkers can actually go ahead and they can cast it at a, as a... As, blah. They can cast it as if it was a 2nd level spell right off the bat, right from 1st level. 
So if they're in a fight and they decide, you know what, this is worth spending my two mana for the day, I'm going to go ahead and deal 44 plus 4 points of damage to this creature, they can do that. So it just gives them a little bit more versatility than sorcerers or wizards usually get. Which I think is kind of cool. Um, I'm interested to see it in play, but we'll, you know, we'll see how it pans out. <clears throat> so this is kind of a shorter version of the example I just gave. Um, next it talks about uh, the Planeswalker spells being contained in magically enchanted tokens known as spell foci or a spell focus in the singular. So these take different forms, depending on the color or nature of the spell. So, for instance, if it is a white spell, you might have it inscribed on coins, like maybe it's stamped onto a coin, um, or maybe it's a medallion, or something like that. It might be a clay disc, as it says here. You've got ivory cards, ritualistic jewelry. It might be an actual, like, scroll like piece of paper that the thing is written on um, but basically they're physical objects that these spells are basically imbued into and as a result you can lose them or you can find them and so that increases your spell repertoire or decreases it if you lose them um, accordingly and the reason I did that is because I was basically looking at trying to model the Planeswalker class off of, one, a game of Magic the Gathering, where you've got a deck of cards, and each spell is represented by a card, and two, the old-school um, Magic the Gathering novel Arena, which I absolutely loved, and in that, it's the same concept. You've got these, you know, fighter mages that are in this big arena, fighting each other, casting spells at each other, and they basically got, like, a little purse or, you know, satchel or backpack or fanny pack or whatever the heck you want to call it, full of spell tokens that they're using to cast at people. So um, it's kind of to represent that. Um, next, it talks about how mana is represented by different components. So they're kind of like original or material spell components for wizards and sorcerers, but we use something called vessels. And they have to be related to the mana type in question. So the, maybe the planeswalker has, you know, a, a volcanic rock that they use to inf invest with um, red mana. Or maybe they've got a some sort of animal skull that they've inscribed runes onto or whatever for black mana. Um, it could be a few different things, but it's basically just something that has to tie into the color of mana that they are um, infusing into this particular vessel. Um, let's see. Got some examples here. So black mana, you know, you could infuse into a pouch of bone powder or a canopic jar containing preserved flesh. Blue mana casters keep vials of seawater or sand on their persons to represent the islands that blue mana comes from. Planeswalkers uh, might have uh, packets of seeds or, you know, wild mushrooms, again, kind of covered in arcane runes or maybe treated with different alchemical mixtures, whatever the case is. Um, volcanic rock, packets of ash can contain red mana. And then you've got um, soil from farm or shards of pottery containing white mana, just as examples. Again, trying to be evocative of the, you know, the feel of that particular color of mana. All right. So, and then it just talks about how you regain mana and everything like that. So, I tossed something in at this point that, pardon me, just one second, folks.
All right. Sorry about that, folks. Slight technical difficulty there. Uh, I think we're fixed now, though. All right. So, um, basically, it just is saying that planeswalkers can't multi-class with other other spell casting classes. Um, I'm sure I could come. I'm, I definitely will come up with a an in-game kind of thematic reason for that. But for right now, it's mostly to avoid the headache of trying to figure out how traditional spell slots interact with Planeswalker mana and all that other stuff. So we'll just keep it with that for now because it's going to make life easier, and we'll move on. So spells known, again, we talked about that. They start with four cantrips, one first level spell, and they gain more by finding spell tokens, and they can have any number of spell tokens, potentially. So, gaining and attuning to new spells. Planeswalkers are going to basically, again, they find spell foci, and they are going to attune to these. They can only attune to a number of spell foci equal to twice their Planeswalker level, plus their spellcasting ability modifier. So this has a pretty wide range. At first level, they get two, plus their spellcasting ability modifier of, you know, most likely plus three, plus four, giving them a total of five th spells that they can attune to. Um... <clears throat> So basically, as a first level planeswalker, if you go ahead and say, you know, I've got these four cantrips in this first level spell, those are my five spells I'm attuned to, you find another spell and you're like, ooh, this one's really cool, then you have to turn around and you have to drop one of your cantrips or your other, your other spell in order to actually attune to that focus and cast that spell. So it's a kind of a way to minimize planeswalkers from being like, oh, you know, I've got... 17 spells to choose from, and I'm only 5th level, you know, stuff like that. So, um, during a long rest, they can break attunement with one spell focus, and then they can attune to another one. So that's kind of cool. Basically lets them choose, you know what, I don't want that spell anymore, I like this one that I found. Uh, let's see. And then, planeswalking, pretty straightforward. It's just, as an action, once per day, you can travel to another plane of the multiverse. You can use it as a reaction, but if you do that, you don't choose which plane you go to. It's totally random. Um, so, has the potential to derail the current storyline, but it's basically a way for people to be like, you know what, this thing's going to kill me. I'm going to get the heck out of here. So, not much more to it than that. Okay, so now, the second level ability from called Mana Kick. So, in 5th edition, again, kind of to keep cantrips useful across the course of a campaign, they set it up so that every f 6 levels, basically at 5th level, at 10th level, or 11th level, etc., you, your cantrips get more powerful, or they've got a bit more oomph to them. So, Firebolt, for example. So if I cast Firebolt just normally as a cantrip and I'm, you know, 4th level or lower, my Firebolt does 1d10 fire damage. Once I hit 5th level, it does 2d10 fire damage. Once I hit 10th or 11th, I forget which, it becomes 3d10, and then the next increment is 4d10. At, I think the max is 5d10, if I remember correctly. Um, but it basically is like, yeah, I can keep zotting you for a respectable amount of damage, with a cantrip if I've run out of spell slots at higher levels. So Mana Kick is basically a way of kind of cheating that system. So a Planeswalker can spend a mana when they cast a cantrip, and they act as if their caster level were six character levels higher than they currently are. So at first level, you cast a cantrip, you spend a mana, or well, technically you don't get this until second level. So if you're second level, you cast a cantrip, and, you know, you decide, I want this Firebolt to do 2d10 damage, you spend the mana, and you are effectively a, what is that, six, 2 plus 6 is 8, you are effectively an 8th level caster for the purpose of the cantrip. So, <clears throat> let me just check something real quick. Uh, da, 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 what am I checking? Oh, okay, so damage die increases by 1 at levels 5, 11, and 17. So, 
that's why it's every six levels. Because once you get to level five, you increase it by six levels, you're level 11. Once you get to level 11, you increase it by six levels, you're 17. So that's, that's the reason it's six levels and not like five or some more logical number. <clears throat> um, but you can only do that up to three times. Um, and once you hit 17th level, it doesn't work anymore because it doesn't keep scaling past that. So, yeah. So this becomes less useful as you go up in level just because your cantrips by default will be doing the extra damage. But it's just a way for you to get more bang for your buck from your cantrips at lower levels. So those are the first two levels um, and their abilities. So the next thing, once we get into level three, we get mana harness, guild sponsor, guild spells, and, you know, the spell, or sorry, the class features start to kind of peter out, not necessarily peter out, they kind of plateau. So every few levels, you're getting a few different things to kind of add to your arsenal. But <clears throat> that's kind of what it looks like at a glance. So first off, at level three, you've got harness mana. So at this point, you can spend an action on your turn, and you can harness mana from the environment. Uh, you gain one mana of a color for which you possess an affinity. So if you wanted black mana, you get black mana. If you have an affinity for red and black, you can choose if you want red or black. Um, you can safely gain mana this way up to your man uh, maximum mana, as shown in the maximum mana column of the Planeswalker class feature table. Um, I'm going to take out the word safely. That was from an old draft. <clears throat> Um, if you are currently in a train type that coincides with the color of mana harvested, you may harness that mana as a bonus action instead. So if you're so if you're high on the summit of a mountain and you're a red mana caster, red mana is associated with mountains, so you basically get to harness that mana as a bonus action, and then you can use your action to do all the stuff you can normally do. So this is a way for planeswalkers to kind of continue to power spells and stuff like that without necessarily starting the day with just a boatload of mana at their disposal. So it's kind of meant to represent in Magic the Gathering, as you're playing the game, you, you know, draw cards, you play extra lands, and things like that. Uh, and you can harness mana a total number of times per day equal to your spellcasting ability modifier, a minimum of one. And then at the end of a long rest, you regain all uses of this class feature. So if you've got... A spellcasting ability modifier of three, then you are going to um, be able to harness mana three times. So at low levels, you gain you harness one mana at a time, so you get three extra mana over the course of a day. Um, as you go up in level, I think it's level 11 and level 17, 18, something like that, um, you get improved versions of that class feature where instead of harnessing one mana at a time, you harness two or the third level version of it, or the third tier of it, is you harness three mana at a time. So, kind of exponentially increases the amount of mana you get out of it. So, next you've got a guild sponsor at third level. So, this is kind of tying into the guilds of Ravnica, where you are well known enough that there is a guild out there that goes, you know what, you're cool, we're going to hook you up with one of our liaisons, our representatives, and they can give you information, they can, you know, they toss a spell or two at you over the course of your career and things like that. You don't have to join that guild. Um, the key thing is that you have to be affi affiliated with a mana color that that guild is associated with. So, it, Demir is black and blue. If you or had a red affi affinity, you couldn't choose a Demir guild sponsor because you're not really, you're not really there. What's the word I'm looking for? You're not their kind of people, basically. Uh, you know, you're not on their guest list. So you have to have the right color mana to coincide with the guild in question. <clears throat> and then when you do that, you get a proficiency of your choice. An armor, weapon, skill, language, or tool proficiency um, when you gain that guild sponsor because the guild basically teaches you something that you want to know. So... And then the other thing they do is they give you a spell. So you get guild spells at different levels. This is tied into the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica book right here. And it is 
it basically for every guild it lists which um, spells you get at different levels. So we're tweaking that a little bit, and instead of just um, adding those to your spell lists and stuff like that, you actually get a spell focus for that a particular spell of your choice. Um, at third level, you get a cantrip, and then as you go up in level, you get additional spells, and then um, yeah, you get additional spells as you go up in levels from those lists. So they're basically uh, free to free tokens or free spell tokens. The ability score improvement, everybody knows what that is. If you're familiar with 5th edition, every, every class gets this at level 4, level 8, level blah, 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 blah. So dual cast. At 7th level, anytime you cast a spell of any level, you can cast a cantrip as a bonus action by spending 1 mana matching the color of the cantrip spell list. Um, obviously, you have to be attuned to the spell focus of the cantrip in question. So this is meant to represent, in magic, being able to cast multiple spells at once, so you might be able to get a fireball off here and summon a creature at the same time. Um, at 10th level, you are able to actually cast cantrips as part of your reaction. So the... Is it the Warcaster? There's a feat in 5th edition that lets you do something similar, where when someone provokes an attack of opportunity from you, you can cast a cantrip at them instead of making a melee attack. So this is kind of the same idea built into the class, um, so that you just spend a mana, cast a cantrip, do whatever it is you want to do. So, and yes, that does mean that as a reaction, you can spend a mana and cast Blade Ward to have the amount of damage that's coming into you, if you have that particular um, cantrip. So there are some really powerful combos that you could do with this, and that's kind of intentional. At 11th level, you get improved mana harness, so you get two mana in any combination of colors to which you have an affinity. Sorry about that. Just when I think this cough is going away, it comes back. And always when I'm on on a stream for some strange reason. <sighs> you know, I just realized something about this one. I have to address harnessing different types of mana as an action or bonus action depending on terrain. I'm gonna highlight that, I'll come back to it later. Next, you've got Alter Spells. So, at 14th level, you can basically take a selection of spells and add them to the spell list of a mana color you have an affinity for. So, let's say you're a red caster all the way up through 14th level. You've not dipped into any other um, any other colors, and you decide, hey, you know what, that, that red spell, I really like that, or that white spell, I really like that white spell. At 14th level, you can actually take that white spell, and for your purposes, it becomes a red spell. And you can do that to a number of spells equal to your spellcasting ability modifier. Um, but you only get to do this once. So you, once you get up into the higher level spells, you're not able to um, turn them into different color spells. So it's a kind of a one-time deal. At 18th level, you get 3 mana instead of 2 whenever you harness. <clears throat> and then at 20th level, you get something called Spontaneous Attunement which basically lets you, as a bonus action, you can spend three mana of the appropriate color based on the spell list of the selected spell. Uh, you break attunement with another spell focus as part of this bonus action. So basically you can be like, you know what, I really need that other spell right now, I'm not attuned to it, I'm going to drop this spell, and I'm going to become attuned to that spell. Although I may... And then it says you may use this feature as a reaction by spending five mana. You know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to take out, take that out. Um, I think I'm going to take out the spending mana requirement as a bonus action. Da, 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 da. <laughs> 
So the reason I'm taking out the mana requirement is because in looking over the number of spell slots that people get and everything like that, vis-a-vis -vis this guy here, um, I kind of feel like the Planeswalkers are going to be lagging behind a little bit across, uh, you know, from levels 1 to 20 in the number of spells they can cast in a given day. So the reason that I'm taking out the spell, the mana requirement there is to kind of mitigate that just a little bit. However, I still think that being able to, you know, change spell focuses or spell foci um, on or as a reaction is pretty potent. So I'm going to leave it as you have to spend two mana to do it. So we'll uh, we'll stick with that for now, and then we'll test it out later. So those are all the features from levels 1 through 20. Basically, you are you have very versatile spellcasting, kind of like a uh, sorcerer. You're able to customize your spells a little bit, kind of like a wizard. And you are able to amplify your spells or cast multiple spells in the same turn. Again, sort of like sorcerers do with their sorcery points, um, but it, the functionality is just a little bit different. Now... Let's talk about mana affinities. So every time you gain, how many, which levels is it? Sorry for the rapid scrolling there. So you get a mana affinity at first level, at fifth level, at ninth level, at 13th level, at 17th level. So by 17th level, you have five mana affinities. You could have an affinity for each of the different colors if you wanted, <clears throat> but it kind of pays to focus on one or two um, and not branch out too much. And so let's scroll down and talk about some of those affinity features. So first level, they're pretty much all skill proficiencies. So in addition to the two you get normally for whatever, uh, or for just before being a planeswalker, you get a choice of one or two for being a affinity or having an affinity to a certain color. So for black, it's intimidation or medicine. At second level affinity, when you're reduced to zero hit points, you can use your reaction to cast a cantrip that you know from the black spell list, uh, and you may spend mana as part of casting this cantrip. So um, you could stabilize yourself, you could deal some last minute damage to somebody. There are a couple different options that you've got for um, how to use that particular affinity feature. Next, you gain advantage on death saving throws, and when you succeed on a death saving throw, you may harness one mana up to your maximum mana amount. So, you basically, if you get knocked to zero, and you succeed on a death saving throw, and you come out of being unconscious, you get a mana back as well. <clears throat> kind of, you know, again, they're very death-oriented and stuff like that. Level 4, whenever a creature within 10 feet of you is reduced to 0 hit points, you can use your reaction to harness 1 mana up to your maximum mana amount. And then 5 is if you fail 3 death saving throws in a row, you may take a reaction to cast 1 spell that you know targeting another creature. You may spend any of your remaining mana as part of the casting the spell. The spell you cast must come from the black spell list. Um, basically, you get a final, you know, a final whammy on somebody if you happen to die. Obviously, that's not ideal. You want to try to avoid that if at all possible. Uh, affinity level 2 for blue is whenever you get hit by a spell attack or fail, fail a spell saving throw, you can use your reaction to make a DC 15 arcana check. If you succeed, you may harness one mana of any color with which you have affinity. This counts against the total number of times you can harness mana. So potentially pretty powerful in that you kind of you get mana every time you get hit by something, but um, you can... It counts against the total number of times you can do that, so it's kind of a trade-off. <clears throat> At level 3 affinity, when you cast a spell, you can spend a blue mana to increase your spell attack bonus or saving throw DC by 1. So if your DC is normally 14, and you're like, you know what, I want to make it a little harder for this guy, spend a blue mana, it becomes 15. So you get a little bit of a bonus on that. Normally, you don't get bonuses to those things, so that's you know kind of a unique thing that I, I put in for uh, these guys. <clears throat> affinity level 4, whenever you successfully counter a spell, you regain 1 blue mana, because you have to spend mana to cast the counter spell, you get 1 back. And then at affinity level 5, when you cast a spell, um, you can do the thing where you increase the DC or the attack bonus, but you have to, sp you can or you can spend additional mana on, on it. So 
If you're like, hey, I really want this guy to fail this check, here's a plus five onto my saving throw, you can do that. Green mana, or for green affinity at level two, whenever you cast a spell of first level or higher using green mana, you get to choose an ally within 30 feet to get a plus two bonus to damage on their next melee attack. So it's kind of to represent um, green cards, like giant growth and titanic growth and things like that, where you can cast them on a creature during the combat phase to increase the amount of damage they do at the last second and kind of, uh, you know, to kill off your enemies and stuff like that. Level 3, kind of same thing. Uh, whenever you cast a spell of first level or higher using green mana, you can spend one or more green mana. For each mana you spend, an, a creature within 30 feet of you gains a plus 2 bonus to AC until the start of your next turn. So again, that's to represent like boosting your creature so that it's tougher, so that it doesn't die when your opponent or when you block an opponent's creature. So Affinity 4 for green. Whenever you cast a conjure spell of first level or higher using green mana, you can spend a green mana and you can enlarge it. Uh, you can enlarge the, one of those creatures for um, as per the enlarge reduce spell. So one or more green mana. A number of summoned creatures equal to the mana spent. There we go. <clears throat> and then finally, when you cast a Conjure spell of first level or higher using green mana at Affinity level 5, you can actually increase the spell level without spending additional mana. So um, you can only do this once for free, but it's basically a free you know, boost to that particular spell um, when you're doing Conjure spells at green level at gr for green. <clears throat> Red, at second level, um, when they cast a spell of first level or higher using red mana, they increase their speed by 10, or they gain temporary hit points equal to their spellcasting ability modifier. And that's a choice that the player can make whenever they cast a spell of first level or higher using red mana. At third level, um, you can spend additional mana to gain an extra reaction until the beginning of your next turn. Um, that in particular was a thing that I stole from Asmodeus 11. Uh, I linked him in the very top of the... Uh, Planeswalker document, um, his original, like, his version of the Planeswalker that I kind of um, used some of his stuff for inspiration when I developed mine. At level 4 affinity, when you cast a spell of first level or higher using red mana, the next melee weapon attack roll you make before the end of your next turn deals extra damage equal to your spell casting ability, ability modifier, plus the amount of red mana used to cast the spell. So it's really about dealing extra damage, which fits in with being a red caster. Finally, whenever you take Acid, Cold, Fire, Lightning, Poison, or Radiant damage, you may spend one mana to instead regain hit points equal to the amount of the damage. Basically meant to represent you absorbing some of those elemental damages and things like that. Um, you know, just a... Equal to half of... Half the amount of damage. I don't know. I thought I added that in last time I did an update to the document, but it looks like it didn't save. Um, so yeah. And then finally, white. Level 2 affinity, when you cast a spell that restores hit points, you may spend one mana to also give that target resistance to cold, fire, etc. or radiant damage until the beginning of your next turn. So you heal them, and you give them resistance to something. When you, uh, this is kind of rep meant to represent the old school circle of protection um, white spells. It was like one white, one other circle protection against green, circle potential protection against black, etc. So, affinity three. When you cast a spell that restores hit points, you may spend one or more white mana, and the target gains temporary hit points equal to your spell casting ability modifier times the amount of white mana spent. So you spend one mana to cast healing word. You give your buddy, you know, 1d4 plus 4 hit points back, you can spend 2 additional mana, and then you add, if your spellcasting ability modifier is 4, they also get 8 temporary hit points on top of that. So. Uh, 4, when you cast a spell that restores hit points, you can spend 1 mana to give that target resistance to all damage against the next attack they suffer before the beginning of your next turn.
And then at 5, whenever you cast an Abjuration spell of first level or higher, you may cast like an Abjuration cantrip as a bonus action without spending any mana. So, really focusing on like healing and protection spells and stuff like that. Which is kind of what white is all about when you play magic. So that's the idea there. Um, I feel like those are all pretty, again, kind of evocative of the different colors of, of uh, magic cards. So I think they fit pretty well. And then finally, we've got the spell lists. I went ahead and took all the spells at each level, and I divided them up amongst the different colors according to theme. So like black, they get a lot of necromancy and poison-related spells, um, a lot of like things related to like madness and um, you know stuff like that. Blue gets a lot of they get counter spell. They get a lot of the more utility style spells. So the blue is a little bit. Um, lighter on damage spells, but it gives you a lot of versatility. It gives you tongues and water walk and far step and legend lore and pass wall and all these other things that kind of represent what blue cards do in magic. So, green is a lot of nature related spells, so a lot of the stuff from the ranger and the druid spell lists end up here. Um, but they also get some cool stuff, like they get regeneration, because that's actually a green spell in, uh, or a mechanic that's frequently in green. It's also a spell from one of the early sets. I think it's called Regenerate. <clears throat> um, they get a few things kind of related to manipulating earth and attacking with like stone and things like that. But yeah, it's a lot of naturey related stuff. They get some. They get the really cool. Um, shape-shifting spells, and things like that. Red is damage. Lots and lots of damage. Pretty much anything you think of that deals direct damage as a magic spell, a lot of those are going to be in here. Scorching Ray, um, Elemental Weapon, Flame Strike, Prismatic Spray, all that stuff. They get a few utility spells, like they get Haste, they get Expeditious Retreat, um, you know, they get Oops. They get basically all the stuff that deals damage, but they also get a few things like Wall of Stone and things like that. So they can put out a lot of damage. They can't like they can't fly as easily. So that's where, you know, crossing over into other mana affinities might be worthwhile. <clears throat> Finally, white is a lot of kind of divination related stuff. Um a lot of protection, a lot of healing. So, Globe of Invulnerability is one of their things. Resurrection, um, True Resurrection, they've got Sunburst, so they've got some damage stuff. Conjure Celestial, they've got, they get Locate Object, they get Divine Favor, I mean, just lots of things that buff up their allies and things like that to kind of represent White's focus on enchantments and, um kind of like teamwork and things like that. So that's that's what the white spell list consists of. <clears throat> I went ahead and I tallied up all the different spells by color when I was done with that, just to figure out who has the most spells um, at different levels. It's pretty balanced at the cantrip level. Um, black and blue come in with one fewer than the rest of them. So if they're kind of highlighted in gold, it means that that color or those colors have the most spells for that particular level. So these guys are all tied for 9, these two are tied for 8. At first level, it kind of flip-flops. Black and blue are tied for 15, the other three are tied at 14. At level 2, they all have 13 spells across the board. And then you can see it kind of jumps back and forth for the other um, or for the rest of the spell levels up the way all the way through 9th. End result being that blue ends up with the most spells total in its list at 94, and red ends up seven spells behind that at 87. Now, I'm actually not too concerned about that, because a lot of spells are used for combat. So red casters get more combat spells. I don't mind if they have a slightly fewer options, ultimately, in their grab bag. Whereas blue is all about utility and being able to do cool different things with your magic. So it makes sense that they'd have a couple more tricks up their sleeve. Again, they have fewer combat spells, so giving them more spells overall isn't necessarily a bad thing. 
But I think it's a pretty good spread. Not too unbalanced or anything like that. Um, the one thing that really kind of bums me out is that I, I kind of feel like green gets left out more often, but obviously blue has fewer spells overall. So, you know, green and blue just, they just came in behind the rest of them. They're, the spells, again, I divide them up kind of thematically. Every once in a while, if, like, I think at, like, 6th and 7th level, black and blue had a lot of spells in there, and so I think I might have shifted them over to other colors that I thought kind of fit them, just so that they had more options at those spell levels. So, it's not all a perfect match, but it, I think it's pretty strong. But yeah, that is it. Uh, I am going to go through and I'm going to tweak the amount of mana, depending on what I find with my Excel spreadsheet here. But for the time being, it's pretty solid. It, it'll work for now. Um, it's just a matter of fine-tuning those mana numbers, making sure they can cast enough spells to make them, you know, strong spellcasters. So, yeah, that is, whoops, that is it. That's the, the Planeswalker class. <clears throat> uh, we welcome feedback or anything like that. Uh, this will be posted up on our YouTube channel when we're done here. You can just Google uh, Ravensdale Roleplays Ravnica in order to find it. Um, I think we're the only... Well, no, I shouldn't say... We're not the only Ravnica campaign on YouTube. You'll find a few of those. Uh, so if you do Ravensdale Roleplays Ravnica, it'll come up. But please check out the Planeswalker class. The link will be he, um, in the video description on YouTube. So you'll be able to get to this document. You can, you know, take a look at it, playtest it, try it out. Feel free to send us messages about how to improve it or anything you found that might be problematic. Uh, you can do that. You can find us on Instagram at ravensdale.publishing. Feel free to send us a DM and we'll get back to you. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for watching. Please um, follow us here on Twitch. If, you wa if you're watching this on YouTube, please like the video, maybe subscribe, click the little notification bell, you know, all that stuff that everybody always says at the end of these videos. Um, but seriously, following us would be awesome. We really appreciate you watching. And we hope you'll check out the rest of our campaign and some of our other stuff. Thanks very much. And we will see you next week when we're actually going to start planning. Um, we're actually going to start planning out the campaign. I have some vague ideas as to what I want to do with it, but it's kind of just broad strokes at the moment. I actually didn't want to start detailing encounters or NPCs or anything like that until I was doing it live on a stream because I think it'd be kind of cool. I don't know how many DMs actually sit down and explain their thought process or their encounter um, building process live for an audience. So I figured that would be kind of a regular thing that we do here. So yeah, I'll see you next Wednesday at 7. And uh, in the meantime, have a great week, and we'll see you later.